you. Thanks to the organizers of this panel, all of you being here. Um, it's my pleasure to come here and uh, learn from the California Native Plant Society. Um, so, as you know, I'm a sociologist, uh, but I'm also um, like a plant lover. I don't think I'm quite a plant nerd. I don't know that much uh, about the botany and the horticulture, but I love plant nature. And living my life in Los Angeles, the more I looked around me, the more I was convinced that we can't understand gardens, California gardens, and plant nature without understanding how it's evolved and been shaped by migration. So immigration and our California gardens are inextricably uh, intertwined, and, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So from the late night, and I did my research, I'm gonna tell you, I did my research in Southern California, but I think a lot of it is applicable to other parts of the state and to what's going on elsewhere in our country. So from the late 19th century onward, uh, Southern California was really sold as a garden paradise, uh, right? This place with rich soil, this warm Mediterranean climate, a place where lawns, palm trees, um, just about anything uh, would grow if you give it lots of water and then fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, but what's the upshot of this? Well, let's see. There you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm really um, incompetent when it comes to technology. So, the question is, has this created a garden of Eden on earth or a new kind of garden of evil? Um, beautiful uh, banana tree from an inner city community garden, Pico Union neighborhood. So um, I think all of the damaging environmental consequences of invasive plants, imported water, chemicals, pesticides, well known uh, to many people and especially to this group. But I think the social consequences and especially the labor consequences, the labor processes of this form of garden cultivation are less uh, recognized. And I believe the role of conquest and migration in this dynamic has also been overlooked. Um, so that's what I'm gonna focus on today. California gardens, I think you can see them as social projects. They're social, cultural, and even political products that reflect history and the sedimentation of various migrations. So I'm gonna first cover the history. I'm gonna kinda of do like a reconstructed history uh, very quickly, and then I'm gonna focus on the important role of Latino immigrant workers in California gardens. Uh, it's based on ethnographic and interview research that I did with Latino immigrant men, assisted by my then graduate student, now Professor Hernando Ramirez. And this is about men who work in suburban maintenance gardens. And I'm going to describe the occupational structure, what the job is like, what the consequences are like for them socially, on the body, and in terms of social mobility. Uh, these are the men who are out there raking, weeding, mowing, blowing, cutting lawn, fertilizing in middle class and upper class residential gardens, and actually even in working class gardens in Southern California. Um, and it's going on from here to Long Island, to Atlanta, to the suburbs of Chicago, etc. And then I'm gonna conclude by suggesting some alternative gardening practices um, that could build on the horticultural skills and the experience that many of these men bring with them from the rural ranchos of central western Mexico, suggesting innovative models that could promote uh, social justice, another kind of green jobs um, that is focused, uh, centered on metropolitan areas, um, ones that would allow for dignity of labor and environmental practices that are sustainable both socially, culturally, um, as, as well as environmentally. And I'm also gonna say that Latina immigrant women have a lot to offer too. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Shameless plug. 
uh, from my book. So this is again part of my book. In the book I also look at inner city community gardens in uh, some of the poorest neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And I look at the elite botanical gardens where a uh, very wealthy group of transnational Chinese and Taiwanese uh, immigrants have uh, created a new Suzhou style uh, Japanese garden, a uh, Chinese garden. But the starting point of this book is a migration lens, right? Nearly all the people, all the plants, all the water um, in Southern California come from elsewhere. Um, so, um, you know, there's this idea of people trekking to California for a good life. It's an old idea, right? It goes back to the Bible, the, the Garden of Eden, uh, you know, the, the Islamic paradise. It's all about the search of looking for beauty, health, tranquility, sacred space, quiet space, transcendence in gardens. Um, and uh, I'm all for that, but I think it's also important to recognize that the flip side is that this has entailed violent conquest of land, people, and labor exploitation. So this duality of gardens is a constant theme, right? All these gardens, as I see it, encompass power and pleasure. So who brought all of these exotic plants, as we call them, to California? Well, a lot of different people did, but it begins with the Franciscan uh, missionaries. So uh, in the 18th century, and this is um, a historically, I think, uh, well-researched uh, illustration of the, the San Gabriel mission uh, in San Gabriel Valley of um, uh, just east of Los Angeles, one of the first missions and one of the first really elaborate um, uh, ones with plant orchards. Um, so the Padres established the mission system with plants imported from around the world. And we still call many of these plants today mission, right? Mission figs, mission grapes, um, mission olives. Uh, this was all part of the Colombian exchange, right? With people, plants, diseases in transit um, from one continent to another. And then as it turns out, many of these plants made successive migrations. So the Padres, uh, the Franciscans planted trees that came from Mexico after they had made the journey from Europe and before that from Persia or from China. You get this idea of crisscrossing um, the globe. Uh, so these mission gardens are really places of stunning beauty, as I think this uh, illustration suggests, but there are also places of great human suffering, right? They depended on coerced Indian labor, floggings, beatings, coerced baptisms, uh, rapes, enslavement. Um, uh, and, you know, you can see this. Uh, some of you might have fourth graders and they have to make the mission project in North California public schools. You might have to visit these missions. And if you have your eyes open and you go to San Gabriel Mission, you can see an unmarked grave for 6,000 Indians. Well, all of the fathers have, are you know, planted in the nice courtyard. Um, you can see these huge vats where uh, Indian workers had to stand and you know, burn tallow and just, you know, the best, it's a very haunting kind of experience to go to these gardens. This kind of beauty and suffering is still very present. So the missions were secularized uh, by Mexico. We then entered this uh, Mexican rancho period, more pastoral, more cattle grazing. And then in the late 19th century, um, we enter this Anglo-American period uh, in Northern California, we know it as the gold rush. In Southern California, it was really a garden rush. Um, it was about uh, Anglo-Americans from the East Coast and the Midwest coming to Southern California in search of the good life, right? Health, beauty, getting away from the cold winters and also getting away from the new undesirable Southern and Eastern Europeans. 
um, Slavic Jews, Italian Americans, Greek immigrants who were then crowding into Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, New York. Um, so there was a big citrus boom in Southern California and a big population boom. Southern California was really sold as a racialized kind of space. It was supposed to be the white spot. Um, but of course, it rested on the labor, the coerced labor, of largely Mexican and Chinese and other Asian immigrant workers. Um, so in citrus fields, in truck farms, in home gardens, and in elite estates, like um, the photos you see there. The one on the left is from the Waddles estate, now site uh, over there of a huge community garden, kind of close to Hollywood. And the right uh, photo there is from the Huntington Garden, right? Henry, Henry Huntington, the nephew of Collis Huntington, one of the big uh, war railroad barons. Um, so the garden cell was really good uh, for the boosters, the railroads, and the real estate developers. And there was this incredible golden age of gardening in Southern California, right? People came from the Midwest, they discovered, oh, wow, I, don't, I can grow a palm tree outside and um, you know, have fresh squeezed orange juice and have my British style lawn and um, et cetera. So um, these develop uh, later in the later period of uh, the mid um, 20th century uh, into suburban tract homes, right? A lot of the orchards are cut up into tract homes. The San Fernando Valley is irrigated uh, and sold off. Um, so we, you know, we continue with this theme, right? The backyard garden is part of the American dream. Um, but at that point, most middle class homeowners were doing their own gardening. I mean, think back to like a Leave, it, a Leave it to Beaver episode, father and son mowing their own lawn, <laughs> clipping it. Um, back then, it was really only people who lived in estate gardens or very affluent people who hired uh, immigrant gardeners or gardeners, period. Um, uh, and various men worked in this kind of job, mostly men from rural backgrounds, but Russian, Italian, Chinese, Mexican. Um, but beginning in the 1920s, um, Japanese men really uh, developed this as an occupation. They really invented suburban maintenance gardening as we know it uh, today. Um, they blended ethnic entrepreneurship together with manual labor, including their own family labor. Um, so, why then and why the Japanese in particular? Well, in 1913, California passed something called the Alien Land Law, which denied aliens illegible, ineligible for citizenship to have the right to own land. And it is believed by historians that this really targeted Japanese Americans who were so successful in gardening that others, uh, white uh, growers, wanted to crowd them out. So um, Japanese, and, and also Japanese, uh, gardeners benefited from this cultural cachet of Japanese aesthetics. Around the same period of time, uh, there were world's fairs here in San Francisco and San Diego and um, uh, Chicago, and all of these big nation states, powerful nation states, would send their cultural displays. And Japan, an imperial power in the Pacific, sent huge displays, bonsai, flower arranging, and like a whole trucked in Japanese garden. And Americans, and Westerners in particular, uh, fell in love with this very beautiful style of uh, gardens. So I think those three factors really explain why the Japanese were <coughs> able to innovate a suburban maintenance gardening, right? Uh, they had this kind of farming experience, from Japan and in California. They were crowded out by racist legislation, and they had this ability to leverage um, the, the cachet of the Japanese aesthetic. So it was kind of a perfect storm, I think. By the 1930s, maintenance gardening in California, Oregon, Washington, is an occupational niche um, firmly established by Japanese American and Japanese immigrants 
different men. They hired their brothers, their uncles, their cousins, and sons. And they also started hiring Mexican men, Mexican men who were working in the fields too. Braceros, Mexican men who were moving <coughs> out of the Central Valley and into metropolitan areas. Uh, now, the Japanese, it turns out, were very upwardly mobile. Older men retired out of the job. Their sons, when they could, became teachers and doctors and went into other kinds of professions. And Mexican immigrant men took over the occupation. Um, and since then, um, the occupation has grown. Many, many more gardeners, um, many fewer homeowners doing their own gardening, their general maintenance gardening. And we see this expansion so that gardening um, maintenance services are not just a privilege of the very affluent, but middle class, working class. I did interviewing in East LA, in nice neighborhoods in East LA, people are paying somebody else to come in and mow their lawn, right? It's like the capital of uh, Mexico in the United States. It's happening there, it's happening out in the um, Inland Empire. Um, so, um, and, and there's various reasons for that. Um, I want to mention Americans spend a lot of money on garden um, maintenance. Um, before the big uh, recession that we just went through uh, in 2006, um, the National Gardening Association estimates that Americans spent $46 billion on lawn and landscape services. That's not counting the purchase of plants, that's not nursery industry, that's just services. Uh, so I'm now gonna go very fast. Uh, so I um, think these gardeners are really doing a form of paid masculine um, domestic work. It's very stratified. There are men who own the trucks, the tools, who are entrepreneurs. They're out there wearing boots and they're doing the hard work, but um, they're also earning a pretty good living. The men who work for them, the ayudantes, often their kin, their nephews, somebody from their town, are pretty much stuck at dead-end jobs. They're pretty much uh, earning a minimum wage. Uh, a lot of, uh, so this is LA. Um, it's very proud Jardinero here. Actually, a photo was taken in Alhambra, the town right over next to me, a, a town that is about 50% Mexican-American and 50% um, Chinese-American. So it's very inter-ethnic. Um, so, you know, uh, depending on your lens, you'll see different things with this photo, but I want to call your um, attention to his, the wrist brace that he wears. Uh, the work is hard on the body. Uh, uh, these men work for a route of clients. They may work in 12, 13 war gardens every day. They're driving all over town. Um, sociologists have bemoaned the passing of the factory system that once offered um, you know, a, a route to, a ladder to upward mobility. Some of these jardineros are making it in jardineria. Some of them are becoming homeowners, sending their kids to USC and Cal State LA. Um, but there's a lot of tolls. One of them is on the body. Um, uh, another photo. Um, let's see, let's see. Most gardeners do not dress like this, but here is one jardinero we met in uh, Arcadia, a town, an affluent, mostly Asian American <coughs> white town in the foothills. Um, and gardeners all over um, California have been vilified for using the blowers and the gas-powered um, mowing machines. Um, they're not the ones, right, who chose to plant lawn, and they're not the ones, I want to point out, who chose to want to maintain it spotless as though, you know, like it's a Hollywood set with leaves that never fall. And I believe as they've been vilified, um, they have been called, you know, many racist things, but the image of the lazy, sleepy Mexican is one that comes up a lot. And uh, guess what? That was a big uh, type of garden ornament, also less prevalent uh, today. Right. I'm going to end quickly. Um, LA's official flower, also an immigrant. <laughs> um, 
So, you know, basically I want to end on this note that we need to rethink and replant our residential gardens. I know everybody in here believes that, but I think we our next step is also to rethink garden labor, and there's a lot of opportunities for reorienting kind of a new green job sector of Mexican immigrant uh, garter, gardeners who can take care of natives, drought tolerant succulents, Mediterranean plants, I don't know if it's blasphemy to say that in this room, um, and also organic vegetables and fruits, because guess what? Before they came to this country, that's what they did. They did organic rain-fed gardening at home. They're experts, and as I discovered at the Urban Community Gardens where I spent over a year in Pico Union, many women who are doing, working as domestic workers are also cultivating small plots at some of the houses where they go. Right, all kinds of like um, indigenous knowledge um, and skills could be used. Um, so I think we need, um, you know, a paradise transplanted for all. Thank you.